if you want to get ahead as a content preneur, you want to get ahead as an entrepreneur, you want to be part of the upper 1% of the people doing it, this podcast interview will help you do just that. Matt SM, the guy I interviewed in here, he's my neighbor in Dubai, fascinating guy, very, very smart. And it's conversations like these that get you thinking differently, that keep you on track and get you to becoming one of those upper 1% entrepreneurs who are absolutely slaying it in the game. So make sure to watch the whole interview. And if you want more podcasts like this, let me know and we'll keep filming them for you. See you in the interview. Yeah, man. Have, have you had experiences where you like sat down next to somebody who like had achieved the very thing you wanted to? I've always paid to play. So I was impatient and I found people who books I read um, or stuff I'd seen online that I knew had achieved things that I wanted to achieve or I just respected and admired and wanted to learn from. Um, and my approach was pay people. Um, and that was for two reasons. Number one, I think when you pay someone, you've both got more skin in the game and they take that relationship more seriously. And the second thing is I think it stretches you. So the first thing I ever invested in, I think was 3000 pounds and it was to work with Daniel Priestley. And this was six, seven years ago. Um, and at that time, the goal was to make your first hundred thousand. And that just seemed like a crazy number to me. Like I just couldn't fathom making a hundred thousand pounds in a year. And he was like, you can totally get there and here's the formula and we're going to help you do it. And when I committed to that and I was like, I'm going to do this, you know, that, that feeling that you get internally when you're just like fully committed to something and I was like, right, I don't have 3,000 pounds. How are we going to make this work? And he had these payment plans and things. And I think I put the first installment on a credit card. And it was so scary. But there's no way that I would have done the things that I needed to do to get to where I needed to be if I hadn't invested that money for me personally. Why do you think it is some people would also sign up for the same program as you? also be in an equally scary situation financially also say they want a hundred grand a month but then not do anything once they sign up there's a few reasons the reason that i find so when we've had it with our clients is that the pain of not doing things isn't as bad as the pain of doing things. So although it's still painful to spend that money and not get the results, for whatever reason in their mind, it's more painful to do the things. And it's usually based on identity. It's usually based on what we refer to as a way of being. So kind of like how you show up in the world. There's a way of being that you have that right now is serving you. It's like keeping you comfortable or keeping you safe in some way. And so I believe that every time we have to level up in an area of our life, we have to essentially change who we believe we are. And for most people, that's really scary because their sense of self is tied to their sense of identity. And so when you say to somebody, hey, you're going to have to do this thing or you're going to have to become this person to run this seven-figure business... Oftentimes that's just too scary or too painful for people. And so as soon as things happen, they revert back to their old way of being because that's the, that's the thing that's familiar to them. Even if it's painful, it's still familiar. And in some way, therefore, it's still comfortable. This is, I, I fully believe the same thing. And I find that I was actually talking to Andrew Kirby about this a couple of days ago about how I find it the easiest for our younger clients to adapt and change their identity and become somebody new than it is for our older clients because our older clients have so many more years of life experience of like knowing who they are and yeah. so their identity becomes much more cemented. Yeah. Right? Like a handprint in cement. It's like, no, like that's who I am. But a younger kid is still figuring out who they are. They're like, I don't know. Am I smart? Am I good at this? Am I a YouTuber? Am I a creator? Am I extroverted, introverted? These are all identities that haven't yet been cemented in yet. 
right? So I, I really feel like the, not to say like older clients can't succeed. It's just, I don't know if you found the same thing, but like younger clients are just so much more adaptable and nimble and agile and like becoming the person that they need to become. Yeah, I've definitely found that. I have also found clients, young clients that just won't change because they are so ingrained in this way of being that serves them like it. You know, I don't know if you follow Tony Robbins, but he has some amazing work around this. If you ever go deep into Tony Robbins content, he looks at this stuff in depth and he talks about um, the six human needs, right? And sometimes if there's a thing that you do that consistently meets your top three needs, you will still do it even if it's destructive. So take like smoking or drinking as an example, right? Um, if that meets your emotional needs of certainty, of variety, of significance, it's going to be almost impossible to break that habit. So in order to actually create change, you have to change the way someone associates the thing that they do with the thing that they get emotionally. And it's only when that association changes that someone will actually change their behavior. Right. Association. Like when I see mm -hmm. a dog, I associate a dog with like playing and cuteness and like feeling like absolute pure love. But other people, when they see a dog, they associate it with getting bit on the hand or getting killed or something, right? So it's purely association. Yeah, exact same situation, totally different behavior. And it's like us sitting down right now doing a podcast. Some people might associate that with like, oh my God, super high heart rate and my mouth might go dry. I might not know what to say. It might sound stupid. Whereas you and I, I'm curious what you associate doing a podcast with. But me, I associate it with learning. I associate it with mm. uh, connecting with someone. I associate it with making effortless content like what, what are some things you associate yeah. the podcast with yeah same so for me the one of the reasons i started my own podcast this year is because i realized how much flow that podcast put me in and how easy it feels for me and how much leverage i can have when i get someone's attention for 10 15 even 20 minutes and go deep on a topic and I get to pick someone's brains and deconstruct something where I know that that's going in their ears, whether they're sitting on a train or they're doing the cleaning or whatever, like it's going directly into their brain. Knowing the power that that has for me is the thing that drives me to get on a podcast or start my own. And, and do you feel like because that association is so strong that any other like fear-based ones would just dissolve? Like there's nothing you really need to do to get rid of the old ones or the fear-based ones? So it's a belief, right? So you, all of these patterns of behavior are always supported by beliefs. And there's different types of beliefs. There's beliefs about ourselves. There's beliefs about the world. There's beliefs about other people. For me, I came to the conclusion that anytime I become self-conscious or start worrying about myself in some way, when I'm creating content, and that could be a podcast, it could be being on stage, it could be a workshop. Anytime those thoughts and those feelings come up, I'm being really fucking selfish. Because essentially I'm letting my insecurities, my fears, my thoughts get in the way of delivering a message and serving people. So you look at that and and then to you, you're like, I don't want to be selfish. Yeah, I don't. And so then goes back to the beliefs and identity belief. I don't believe I'm a selfish, selfish person or I don't believe that I'm more important. I don't believe my feelings are more important than my mission. Gotcha. Whereas someone else who might believe the opposite would be like, yeah, I am selfish. So therefore screw it. I'm not going to make the contact. Yeah. I think as well, people are just focused on the wrong thing. And I think, so I deal with a lot of creatives, right? That's our niche. We work with creative agencies. And I think this is more prevalent in the creative space because we're so conditioned to believe that our work is intrinsically linked to who we are. So the quality of our work says something about us as a creative and so that really facilitates a way of thinking 
that is very self-centered. And so when we work with clients who work with an animation studio, for example, they cannot get their head around the idea that most of their clients don't care about animation. So when we start going, like, talk about their challenges and their goals and what's going on in their world, they're like, I don't know. I've never had that conversation because they're so focused on themselves and their work. And so by nature, they have these thoughts and these feelings. They have imposter syndrome. They have self-doubt because they are so self-focused. Right. Yeah, I had a, I've had many hours of conversations with artists who want to start making money online as like a coach. But the artists, a lot of artists I've spoken with, not all, but a lot of them have a hard time thinking about what the client wants. And the conversation mm -hmm. keeps coming back to what they, the artist wants. Like, but I want to do this. I want to do this. Yeah. I'm like, okay, but what does the client want? What do you think the client mm -hmm. cares about? And they're like, I don't know, but like, this is what I want. You know, and it's like, well, and I, yeah, like business to me is like, it's really making it about the client. Whereas a hobby is about you. A hobby, yeah. sure, like you want to go rock climbing, you want to abstract art as a hobby. Sure, it's all about you 100%. But business is like, what does the client want? How can we serve them? How can we get them results fastest? How can we market to them? How can we speak their language? Um, so that's, that's not how artists are brought up to think. Like no. even Rick Rubin has a whole book about making good art or great art. And he's like, forget the audience. Ignore the audience. Just make the art. And that's so true for art. Yeah. But it's not business. Business is like, I, I feel like, a, you know, beautiful businesses, there can be a, a mix of like beautiful art and beautiful business sense. Like Apple does a great job with that, right? They make yeah, beautiful artistic pieces of technology, but then also they really understand what the people want. Yeah. And that balance and that combination is, is so important. The other thing I'd say, Ted, is for anyone listening who maybe is struggling with this dilemma right now, switching your focus from internal to external is so liberating mm -hmm. because you can't have imposter syndrome. You can't have self-doubt. You can't have fears and insecurities if you are fully focused on serving externally. Like it's impossible. 100%. Just try it. Like, and, and I'll give you a pure, an example. Let's say one of your close friends comes to you and tells you that something awful's happened. They've just got divorced or they've been diagnosed with cancer or something. You aren't thinking, oh shit, what color jumper should I wear to that meeting? Like you literally aren't thinking about yourself. You're literally just thinking about that other person. Like, oh my God, what's Susie going through right now? It must be terrible. I need to be. And when they're talking, you are just listening to them. If you're a good friend, right? But most of the time, what happens is we have this kind of double dialogue going on. So when we're having conversations with our clients or when we're having conversations with people, we're not actually listening to what they're saying. We're, we're listening to the thoughts in our head and you can't do both at the same time. So my argument is, if you're listening to yourself or you're focused on yourself, you're not really listening or you're not really paying any attention to that other person. Yeah, I've been to a few really good, they're called festivals, but they're really like family gatherings. I've been, they're mm. called fruit festivals. So I'm part of like this like raw vegan community. People just eat raw fruits and veggies. And so we get get together once, twice a year in these big festivals. And what I notice is that whenever I'm at these events, I'm surrounded by other people. I'm talking with other people. I'm like helping other people, conversing with other people. I'm not aware of any of my problems. Mm. All my problems like are just non-even existent. And I only start to become aware of my shit and my problems again. Once I leave the festival and I'm by myself again, or I'm like, you know, staying yeah. in the Airbnb or like I'm traveling, whatever, and I'm thinking about me, 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 me. But whenever I'm around other people at these events, like these small tribes of like 150, 300 people, that circuit in my brain is like not firing about thinking about me, 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 me. It's all about, hey, what's up, dude? Hey, what's up? Hey, how can I help? Hey, do you want a coconut? Like, it's amazing. It's the ultimate mm -hmm. hack for like shutting off that part of my mind, just to get together with other cool people. Yeah. And I think they have to be people that you resonate with. 
And I think this comes back to what you spoke about at the start with being in the room with the right people. And we were just talking before we hit record um, about us both being in Dubai right now. One of the things that for me at this stage of my life I'm looking for is people and places. So I want to be in places that are inspiring and that essentially put me in that state as much as I can because essentially what you're describing is presence like that's what happens like we're focused externally so we don't have that internal monitor going all of the time and that is a form of it's actually a form of meditation because our internal dialogue is quiet we're present with those other people we're listening to what they're saying um and for me right now like the UK is a place where I struggle to get that and I find that the environment creates a lot of internal dialogue for me but also i feel like i'm surrounded by people who are in that internal dialogue and it's almost like you're with people but you're not present and everyone's going around with their own like internal dialogue sort of on autopilot mode and it actually really feels difficult to to connect with people dude i 100 percent on the same same wavelength um here in dubai what i love about the people is that we all came here. Nobody's mm. really from here. You very rarely meet a, a, a local who was born and raised in Dubai because it's such a new mm. city, it's like 45 years old or something, right? Yeah. So everyone here for the most part, I'd say 90, 95% of the people I see every day, they came here, they left where they were, mm -hmm. sold all their shit or moved all their stuff over to come to Dubai for a better life. And that's why I love these festivals I go to because people come there for a good time. Yeah. They're not there by default. Like people in London, most people, I know, I'm sure there's a lot of multiculturalism in London too. And some people did come to London for a better life, but a lot of, lo there's a lot of locals there. Same with Canada. They're just there by default. And the idea of like traveling is like kind of foreign to them. And um, a lot of them don't even have passports, bro. Like mm -hmm. my friend has got kids and his kids had a soccer tournament in, in America and half the class couldn't go to the tournament because they didn't have a passport. So they're just in Canada by default, you know? And so Dubai, the people here, you and I included, it's like we came here because we thought, hey, here we can optimize our life. And what I didn't realize before coming here was that, yeah, everyone here is also here to optimize. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting because obviously we have a mutual connection, Dan Bolton, and in his program, he talks all about this concept of default versus design. Um, and this is something that I talked about in my book um, that I wrote about four or five years ago, but didn't quite articulate it in, in that way. But he says like, is your business being built by default or is it being built by design? And so I think there's a lot of crossover here because I believe how you do one thing is sort of how you do a lot of things and the principles and the mindset are the things that make the shift. And so when you hear people saying um, people's personal life, it's just a, sorry, people's business is just a projection of their personal life. I think what they really mean by that is if the way you think about your business is I'm really designing this to give me what I need, you're probably thinking about your life in that same way. Um, and I think a lot of people, especially clients that we have, they're in the UK, maybe they're in Europe or whatever, and they've just gone through the motions and they've got six, eight, 10 years into their business and they're sat there thinking, why am I doing this? Like, why am I working so hard? Why am I stressed out all the time trying to manage my team? Maybe I'm not paying myself even a lot of money. And I look at friends my age and they're earning like double what I'm earning and, and all of this stuff. And they've created this business and this life by default rather than by consciously deciding what is it that I want to get from this business? What is it I want to get from my life? And then building something to actually support that. 100%, bro. Like the, the, the very first thing we do with our clients is get them to write out what their idea of perfection looks like. Hmm. So the very first thing, what does perfection look like? Like, what are we doing this for? And not just perfection in business, but perfection in your life. Perfection in your yep. life, how does that business, perfect business fit into that? Um, because yeah, like you can either have a business by default or you can have business by design and business by design is so fun. So fun. Mm. 
Um, yeah, it's. I want. I, I don't know what the uh, difference is between people who decide to design their life and those that don't. But like, from a very young age, I well, very young, not that young, maybe like late teens. Late teens, early 20s, I really took pen to paper, like literally speaking pen to paper and wrote down like my perfect life. And I would just brainstorm mm -hmm. doodling on paper, like what does my perfect life actually look like? And that's been so, um, that's been such a powerful exercise. I've continued to do it even now. And it's just so helpful and like reminding me of what I really, really, really want. I think we can forget what we want. One, mm -hmm. one day you can say, oh, I want to do this thing. And then a couple of years later, you forget You're like, oh, yeah, I wanted that. Why didn't I do that? Mm. I get distracted, dude. Well, um, let me ask you a question, Ted. What's more important to you? Security or variety? Security or variety? Um, uh, different areas of life, I guess, like, interesting question. What's more important to me? Security. Well, let me give you an example, right? So you can have security in your life, but it means that you have to do the same thing every single day for the next 10 years, or you can have variety in your life, which means you get to do lots of different things but there's no guarantee of um, how much money you're going to make or where you're going to live or so like what, what part I would, I would, I would prioritize it. I'm not a big fan of the word security, but I would prioritize that. If there's another word for it, like um, doing the same thing over and over. I love that because I love going to yeah. on one thing. Mm -hmm. I love being the guy who practices one kick 10,000 times versus the guy who practices 10,000 kicks. Mm -hmm. so yeah i'm not a big fan of variety for variety's sake like when i when i find i'm the guy when i find a good meal i just stick with that i don't want yeah. to add a meal or when i find a process that works online i stick with that so what did that planning and that pen to paper like in what ways did that give you security i guess because when i wrote it down I, I was like if i can get that i'm set yeah now I have that and I feel set. There you go. So now it's So that's a, why some people do it, right? I think it's a I honestly think it's a values thing. And oh, so because some people they they just want a whole bunch of variety all the time. Well, that's an example. So I just picked those two things because they're the most polar opposite and the most obvious. But it's interesting because you are a business owner, you're in Dubai. There are two things I know about you. Um for most people, if you said, hey, you have to run your own business, so there's no security about how you're going to make money. And like, you might have a bunch of clients, but you might not. You've got to go figure it out. Um, by the way, like, you're going to live in this place, but it's totally new. And, you know, you maybe, I'm sure when you moved here, you didn't know loads of people. Like, all of those things are, would, for most people, be associated to uh, instability rather than stability, right? But, you have a formula. So your formula for getting your values met is if I have a plan and I can see how I can make this work, then I feel secure because I feel confident in my ability to create this. So other people who maybe are just in countries by default or haven't done that planning exercise or are building things by default, maybe they have the same values as you, but they have a different formula and they say, well, how would it work? Like, I don't know if I could figure out running a business. I don't know if I'm cut out for that. Um, but what's this country like? And what are the people like? And I've never been there before. That feels very scary to me. I know I've got this country I live in. And if I have this career path and do these things and do these steps, like I've already got a plan mapped out for me. I know if I go to school, work hard, get this job, settle down, have a family, someone's already mapped that out for me. And I've seen loads of other people do it. And there's loads of support and there's almost like a highway to that path. So that's security. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was talking to uh, Ty Lopez a 
a couple weeks ago about this. I, I booked a private consultation with him just to see what it was like to talk with Ty for an hour. And uh, yeah. the topic came up about risk tolerance. He was asking me mm. about my risk tolerance, my risk appetite. And I hadn't really thought of it before, but it's true that like some people just have a, like Elon Musk's risk tolerance is so high. Like he literally bet hundreds of millions of dollars on like multiple companies at the same time. And most people would just never do that. They don't have this sort of risk tolerance. So Ty was talking about how like on the scale of like high to low risk tolerance, Elon Musk's risk tolerance is like off the freaking scale. So he's asking me like where, where I'm at on that. And I was like, that's a good question. Like my mom is super low risk. She won't take any risk or at least like what appears to her as low risk, right? Yeah, that's, exactly. That's a key factor. What appears to be no risk. Um, whereas I'm much higher up on the scale. Like I became a resident of Dubai. I filled all the paperwork without ever coming here before. Paid mm. all the money, did everything. I was like, okay, I'm going to Dubai. Like relatively high risk. And what if it doesn't work out? But like, who cares? I'll, I'll pivot. I'll do something else. But So uh, that's the thing, right? Is because there's... There's risk from a very um, logically defined view, i.e. there's mathematical risk. But most people aren't going through their lives thinking about risk mathematically. They're not sitting down and doing equations like if this happens, X, like Y, is it? they're not. They're just thinking about their perception of what could go wrong. And this is why I love psychology because... If you look at the data, there is not actually more chance of you having some kind of negative experience in your life as a result of doing those things than somebody who plays it safe. We all know those people, right? We all know those people who they've got a stable job, they've got a family, they've got, they've they've seem to have put loads of security in place, and then one day someone gets diagnosed with an illness or they get laid off from their job or life happens, right? They get in a car crash or whatever it is. There is no real protection from those things. And for me, like the sooner I learned that, the easier it was to do more quote unquote risky things. And my friends say to me like, oh, you've got, you know, you're so lucky. You've got this business you can run from anywhere in the world. And like, it's all online and you have all these clients. And I'm like, but is that luck or did I design that? Like, did I decide that I didn't want to follow the conventional route? Did I make a choice in my head? Like, if I do this thing and it doesn't work, what's the worst case scenario? And so I fell into the trap of security so many times throughout my life, university, jobs, relationships, because we perceive it as more safe. Like we perceive it as, well, if I get this degree, I'm way more employable than this person or if i do this thing then it's going to give me x which means y but in reality i've found that the ultimate security is created through what you said which is self-belief determination skills to actually do that thing like building the skills um and like passion and flow if you have those four things you create a tremendous amount of security because it's not external, it's internal. And it's the difference between resources, i.e. how much money I have in the bank or who I know, versus resourcefulness, my ability to leverage the resources that already exist in the world. And for me, that's the difference between people who are, let's say, entrepreneurial and run their own business and people that maybe just don't take the risks or they have a normal job or they're just building this very kind of safe business. Do you feel like you were revealing entrepreneurial tendencies at a young age? Well, so my parents, my mom worked in a travel agency, but then became like the director. So she basically ran the company. Um, and then my dad had a very stable job till I was about maybe five or six or something, and then started his own carpentry business. So I was definitely surrounded by, and my godfather had 
several businesses. He was like a proper entrepreneur. He had like garden centers and card factories. He was like a bit of a Dell boy. Um, so I was definitely surrounded by those people. Um, and my parents always taught me, you can do what you want to an extent. Like it's more important to enjoy what you do and have opportunities than it is to just take like this set path and kind of always supported me with whatever choices I made. And so I think I felt from a young age that really anything was possible. And I was always someone that asked why. So I went to a school that was like quite a traditional school. Um, for anyone listening into the States, if you, if you imagine like Hogwarts, it was probably like one one notch down from Hogwarts, right? We had actually had robes and stuff when like the prefects called? in our school had, it was called Sutton Valance in the UK. Sutton Valance? Yeah. Are those two words that I don't know? Sutton and Valance? Maybe, yeah, exactly. I mean, that that that's a really good example of how old school it was, right? Um, it even sounds like so, Hogwarts. Yeah, it sounds like Hogwarts, right? And so um, they had a lot of traditions and they had a lot of things that we had to do and there were lots of rules and I never really understood a lot of them. And so I would always get in trouble for asking why we had to do certain things. Um, and so that's definitely been a theme throughout my life. I've always been somebody who believes that anything is really possible and if you ask why enough then you can usually figure it out yeah i love that question too man i ask it a lot one time i was remember I was driving as a kid i was really young maybe like eight or nine or something and i was in the back seat we we're driving down the highway and we, we merged onto the highway and so i asked my dad i was like why is it called merge? <laughs> and he's like, he's like, that's just what it's called. I'm like, yeah, but why? And he's like, he's like, that's just what they named it. I was like, yeah, but why did they <laughs> merge? And he got so pissed. He's like, that's just what it's called. He like flipped out. And I was like, whoa. And so um, I learned then like not to ask my dad why too many times. <laughs> yeah. You're <laughs> like, one of those kids. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like, just, I want to know why. Um, have yeah. you seen the, the interview between an interviewer and that famous quantum physicist, Richard Feynman? Mm, probably not, I don't think. Okay, Richard Feynman is like this old, now dead uh, physicist and very famous, worth watching, amazing speaker from like the yeah. 60s or 70s, maybe 80s, probably 60s, 70s. And somebody asked him why magnets repel. Some magnets repel and some magnets attract. And he's like, his answer to that is so good. It's worth the YouTube searching type Richard Feynman, why? And he goes into like this eight minute explanation of why the question why is such a difficult answer or it's a difficult question to answer because there's so many levels mm. to it. Mm. Like you say, oh, because the atoms repel. Okay, but why? Oh, because yeah. that's just... Um, the way they're structured okay why and it's like okay well that's because blah 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 it's like there's like a million levels to it. it's never ending yeah but it's a fun exercise to do especially in sales like when you get into sales and you're talking to somebody about why they want to join the program dude it can get the person to buy like that if you go deep enough with them we mm -hmm. had a lady who told me she wanted to sign up for the program i asked her why she said, because she wants to make more money. I said, why? She said, be that way she can get out of Florida. I said, Florida is a great place. Why would you want to leave Florida? And she said, oh, I don't like the people here. I was like, well, I've been to Florida. I like the people. Why don't you like the people? And mm -hmm. she's like, oh, because um, my ex is still here. I say, oh, why do you want to get away from your ex? And she said, um, she said, because I'm afraid he'll come and kidnap my children. Whoa. So signing up for this program is now about her saving her children and getting mm. kidnapped. So and they're the people you're going to get the results with, right? Because it's like the famous quote, he who has a big enough why can find any how. Yeah. 
Yeah, but that that that, that little conversation example was like a two minute conversation into the depths of the why and it led to her crying and breaking up and she ended up signing up so it's like the the question of asking why intelligently in a sales conversation can lead to a lot of sales if done if done right mm. yeah 100 percent. um so when you do sales you currently right now you do you do high ticket sales you have a high ticket yeah call? yeah mm -hmm. sell agency owners yeah what is your number one most used sales process from cold to sold? Like how do they find you and then how do they become a client? Typically, most people find us through some kind of online content. And that could be a YouTube video. It could be something I've posted on LinkedIn, some kind of social. Um, people usually consume that to a certain point and then there will be a what's typically referred to as a lead magnet, although I don't really like that word. Um, but for example, you can grab a free copy of my book. We have something called the agency roadmap where they can answer like 25 questions and it gives them a custom roadmap um, to grow their agency. So they'll typically download that. And then we'll ask them a bunch of questions. So whenever someone interacts with us, there's usually four or five questions that we ask everybody just so that we can kind of segment people into buckets in terms of people we can help, people we can maybe help in the future, but not right now, and people that we just totally can't help. Um, and so we'll get some data from them. And then depending on the answer to their question, um, one of the questions is, are you looking for help with this? And so if they answer yes to that question, usually we'll just reach out to them and say, hey, tell me more about what you're looking for help with. Um, if they don't, then we typically run two things. Number one is like a one-to-one -one strategy session with our head coach. And the second thing is a workshop, which is something that I run. And it's like a little group workshop once a month. Um, and people apply for that. If we think that they're going to find it valuable, then we invite them. If they're not at the right stage of business, that we then we don't. And basically, we just give all of our best thinking and just run through all of our best case studies on that workshop. And let's say we have 10 to 12 people on it, usually five or six want to find out more and book in a call. And then out of those people will select one or two to actually work with. So a couple questions about that. Um, you said you asked them three or four questions to kind of determine where they go in your pipeline, so to speak. Where or how do you ask those questions? It's like a jot form or Google form or? So we use something called score app. Um, and it's really, really simple. So as soon as they put their details in, screen pops up and it will just ask questions and it will say, hey, tell us a little bit more about your business so that we can send you personalized content. And then it just goes through those those four questions. And then depending on what they answer, um, it will take them to different screens, basically. So they answer all four questions on the same screen or it's like they answer one question, the next question pops up. Yeah, they answer one question, then it goes to the next one. And there's like a little progress bar. What, on the is, what is their incentive for answering these questions? Good question. Um, They don't necessarily have one, but interestingly, and I don't know the psychology behind this, most people answer them. Hmm. So they download your freebie and then on the next page that pops up. Yeah, it just says, hey, how long? So it's just like if you imagine you're already in the momentum of doing this, yeah. maybe people think that they can't get the freebie until they've answered the questions. I don't know. But... It's like you download this thing that you want. And the first question is, how, are you running your business full time? Gotcha. So it's literally well, just click feels, yes or no. Feels part no. Of it. Feels yeah. Cool. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I've done something similar because I also want to put people in these different categories. And so what I did is I, is I gave away a, um, a meal plan. This is back when I was doing like the, the nutrition stuff. I gave away a free meal plan. On the next page, it said, wait, if you want my recipes so that you can make the meals in the meal plan, fill up this quick survey. And so they'd answer mm. these questions, boom, 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 boom. And then they get the recipe book as well. And that had like a super high completion rate because who would want the recipes for the freaking meal plan, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. The missing gap. Yeah. So that I thought I needed incentive, but you're saying you don't even give them incentive. You're just like, answer these questions and they still answer it. The the thing that we just say is a small message that says um, personalized content, basically. So gotcha. we won't. Oh make the same offers and send the same stuff to people who aren't running their business full time yeah. and are doing less than 5k a month than we will to people that are. Gotcha.
And then the next question I had is, uh, you mentioned you do this workshop, this monthly workshop, right? Mm -hmm. Do you do the same workshop on repeat every month? We personally do. We've been advised by Dan and a few other people to mix it up. Um, but at this stage, we're just trying to nail something that's like super valuable and just build on it and build on it and build on it so that it's just easy for me to run. I don't really have to think about it. Um, we know it's valuable because we've got a bunch of people coming through it going like, oh my God, that was super valuable. The problem with switching something up each time is A, you've got to come up with new content, which takes time. Mm -hmm. And you could argue, we'll just do the stuff that you're doing with your clients. But yeah, I've got some thoughts around that. Um, and the second thing is you don't know if it's any good. Right. So you're like, let's say you've done a workshop with your clients that are like, oh, that was cool, but I could do X, Y, and Z. Then you're trying to take feedback from your clients to address it in time to run the thing for the prospects. And it just like changes the way you show up. Whereas I know that when like I drop an insight in this workshop or I use a case study or a framework or an example, I just know it's going to be powerful for people. Yeah. Yeah. When I was doing webinars weekly as well, I had the same conversion every time. It was like 20, 30% would convert. Every mm -hmm. time, did the exact same webinar, same intro, same story, same call to action, every time. Mm -hmm. But eventually I got so burnt out by doing the same thing. And I was wondering, what if I could just like record 90% of it, but do the intro live and then mm -hmm. in a cool way, segue into the recorded webinar where they wouldn't know it's recorded because um, I was there live. I called it the name. Hey, Matt, what's up, bro? I call it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it is live. And then, okay, let me turn my slides. The slides come on. It's automated for the whole bulk of it. And then I come back to the Q&A wearing the same shirt that I was wearing for the bulk of it. And I'm like, hey, guys, so hopefully you found that super helpful of a Q&A time. So would you ever consider doing like a hybrid like that where the intro is live, the outro is live, but the middle part is recorded? Maybe, but our, ours are called workshops for a reason. They actually are workshops. So we get people, we give them a workbook and we get people doing stuff in it. Um and I've just found that if you give people the experience of working with you, they're much more likely to want to work with you. But so, it's a webinar, it's a workshop. Yeah, it's a workshop. And we're getting people to score their business in certain areas. We're getting them to, like, we're doing little questions, like, who's got a question about that? Or what's, you know, we're using the chat quite a lot. So, like, what's your insight on this? What happens when this happens? And so I could probably do it. But, yeah, I like to get a feel for people as well. So, you know, let's say someone rocks up to the webinar and they're just super difficult. Like, oh, well, I've tried this and it doesn't work. Or what about this? And blah, blah, blah. You just like, if they book a call, you're just saying to the my head coach, like, dude, I don't think this guy is coachable. So just be prepared, like spend maybe 10, 15 minutes with them, but probably not a good fit. So just a heads up. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's more of a like feeling thing, I think. Gotcha. That makes sense. If it's interactive, then wouldn't want to do pre-recorded, I don't think. But and we uh, and we stopped doing it for a while because I'm the same as you. I got burnt out. I was doing I'd done it for like four or five years, like pretty much the same one, made some tweaks every single time, made it better and better and better. Um, I mean, if you literally Google my name and go to our Google reviews page, I think I've got like a hundred and something Google reviews, and they're literally all about people that have attended that workshop for free. Um but yeah, I just got I just got bored of it. So we took a break for a while. We tried switching things up, going straight from um, download to like book a clarity call with our coach. Like the uptake on that wasn't great. And so we're just sort of getting back into the rhythm because we know it works. So, so content. Yeah. Free download, questionnaire, workshop if you qualify, workshop invite yeah. if you qualify, right? Yeah. Workshop yeah. Invite. Um, and then how that workshop only gets invited, only certain people get invited to that workshop, right? Based on their questions. Yeah, we've broadened that out a little bit just because we've introduced like um, a slightly lower offer. Um, but typically that's how it worked. Typically it was very much an invite only. We would aim to get 10 to 12 people on a Zoom, just literally like this. I love that. Be super interactive. That's really yeah. cool. Like I, I have done a lot of webinars and workshops. And in the past, it was since I knew I was converting at 20, 30% every time, I was always striving for those big attendants. Like I wanted 300 people. And if I got 200, I was like, fuck. If I got 100, I was like, fuck. And if I got yeah. 80, I was like, and if I got 50, I was like, Jesus. And if I got like 20, I was like, oh my God. 
But what I realized, yeah. despite being upset with the number, what I realized was that I always felt so much better personally when it was a small group between like five and 10 people. Hmm. Like it just felt better. I didn't have to like be yelling from a stage. I yeah. could just be speaking with the group as the, as like just part, I could be feel like part of the group. And, uh, yeah, and I just feel like it, it does a few things. Number one, it builds positive brand equity in the market because people go out and go, wow, I went to this workshop. It was really cool. They tell their friends about it. Um, number two, it's a great way for them to experience what it's actually like to work with us because we only work with a maximum of 30 clients a year. Um, and so our group calls are like usually probably maximum 15, 20 people on the call. Um, but most weeks it's probably closer to 10 to 12. So they get that experience. It's like, well, oh, what's it like on the program? Well, you know, the workshop thing you came to, it's exactly like that. But rather than running through a step-by-step -step thing, we're just talking about specifically your problems and your, in your business. So you've already experienced that. You already know what it's like. Love it. Cool. I like that, man. Mm. Yeah, I've done those in the past and they've done really well, but I've never thought to use them with cold prospects. I've only done those workshops with paying clients. And you mentioned right. something you said you've got some thoughts on giving the same content to your paying clients as to cold clients. What are your thoughts on that? Or cold prospects, I should say. Well, if you look at people like Tacky Moore, um, he does it really well because he takes part of it. So he, I don't know if you've ever seen Tacky's um, thing where he, he dissects the diagram and he talks about the who, what, why, and how. And he says, like, just give the clients no, uh, sorry, give cold prospects no how, which is basically means like, just take the right hand side of that. So you give them the why and the what, but you don't give them the how and the now. Um, and that kind of works because oftentimes people will just get value from, from insights. They'll get value from understanding more about their problems for me personally it's almost double the work because if you have to modify the thing that you do with your clients for your prospects then you're almost still doing the same work whereas if you just present the same thing all the time you're sharpening that sword and it's a little think about it like the way i think about it is like a stand-up comedy routine right if you hold think on, if on, you look on. at yeah hey, We'll come back to the stand up comedy routine in just a second. Are you saying that you believe you should give people who aren't paying you the same content as the people who are paying you or not? To an extent, but I believe the value in coaching is in the implementation. I don't believe it's in the idea. Correct. So the so, idea is your thoughts, your information. You're giving the same to both parties, paying and free? Basically, yeah. And you're just charging for the actual implementation and the personalization. Yeah, and the depth and the tools and okay. the community okay, and okay. the, yeah. we're, we're on the, the same game thing. plan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so sorry, back to your stand up sharpening the sword routine thing. Yeah, so so if you imagine you've got you've got a stand up comedian and they're gonna go and do a different show every week, and then you've got another stand up comedian who's doing the exact same show every single week, at the end of the year. Who's going to have a better Netflix special? The one that's been doing the same show every week or the one that's been doing a different show every week? Thanks, dude. Yeah. So if you actually look at how even big stand-up comedians like Ricky Gervais, Trevor Noah, people like that. So Ricky Gervais is currently doing a what he calls like a micro tour in London. And he'll do arenas. Uh, sorry, arenas. He'll do clubs um, of like 50, maybe 100 people max. And he just tests out his new material and he'll do like 20, 30, maybe even 50 of those shows. And he'll see what jokes work, what jokes don't. And he'll just test and test and test and test. And then when he goes out to tour, he's doing the same show every single night. So when he comes to a city and does like three nights, well, when he tours the UK, it's the exact same show. The exact thing you're seeing on Netflix is the thing that he's done 50 times. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. So he knows it's going to work. That's, uh, I can see that applying really well with being an educator online, being a coach. Yeah. My, my, one of my mentors used to say a thousand great pitches. Your business will, will be where you want it to be when you've done a thousand great pitches. Cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. You learn, you learn what works, what doesn't work. Hmm.
what to keep uh, in, what to take out. Yeah. Yeah. But then it comes to a point too, where I've, I've been in this situation before, bro, where, like I said, I was at that 20 to 30% conversion rate every time with the webinar. And rather than focusing on getting more people to show up, so turning the 200, 300 into like 600 to 1,000, rather than focusing on growing that, I was just so overly focused on trying to increase the 20, 30% show or 20, 30% conversion to like 35, 40. And just wasn't seeming to budge, but I put all my effort into that. How do I get like an extra 1%, 2% conversion? Versus just getting more people in, you know? Mm. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs suffer from this. where like, they know that their close rate is say 25% on the phone, right? Let's just say it's average. And they put all their effort into how do we go from 25% to 30% to 40% versus just getting way more calls booked, right? Because if you know that- Yeah, I mean, there's two things. If you can hit that consistently, then that's definitely sound logic. And if you have the capacity- to turn on the tap at the top, then that totally works. I think there's a whole new set of challenges that come with hiring an appointment setter and, you know, like someone to take sure. those calls. And... For that model, for that model. But like, let's say another yeah. model. Let's say another model, like it's infinitely scalable, like because um, subscription membership. Like courses or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like still people overly optimize for conversion versus traffic at a certain point. Mm-hmm. And it's really interesting because I've suffered from that too. And on paper, it doesn't make sense. You're like, dude, just get more leads, get more. Yeah. Traffic. But you're like, yeah, but I could go from 10% conversion to 12. If I just fix like, what is the little secret ninja 2% hack? I'm like, bro, why are you putting all your focus on that? Shit? Just get more traffic. It's really interesting. Yeah. Maybe sometimes that's the like easier or slightly more comfortable thing. Yeah. It's very comfortable on. because you're just doing design. You're just like changing some graphics. Mm, tweaking. Yeah. Yeah. yeah little tweaks that you're like, oh, that's better. Yeah, that's definitely better. That's better. Mm. That's the whole time you could have been running ads or something, doing JVs or something that would have actually blown you up. But I think a lot of people are afraid of blowing up and becoming super well-known, super famous, super successful. Like we talked about at the very beginning of this call about people's identity, feeling comfortable in their identity of like who they are. I think mm. a lot of people don't feel comfortable being a millionaire. Yeah, 100%. Like, like people... To them, that's almost like corrupt or it's like mm. not right to have so much money when there's so many poor people in the world or it's not right to have more money than their parents. It's not right to be earning in the top 1%. It's not right to just have so much wealth and not be doing anything good in the world with it. Like, so they, they sabotage. Um, yeah, and that's the work, right? That's the inner work. That's the work that we have to do as entrepreneurs. The self- And not everyone has to do it, by the way. Because so what what I mean by that is so if I look at one of my mentors, Daniel Priestley, he not only when he was young, like 16, 17, started making a lot of money, like he started running, um, he put on under 16 nightclub nights or under 18 night, nightclub nights in Australia. And he must he was about the same sort of age, and he charged, I don't know, 20 pounds or 20 bucks or 10 bucks or whatever it was at the time. And like thousands of people showed up and he literally had the experience of having bags of cash that mm -hmm. like he just took away from those nights. And then he went and worked with another mentor and a startup and the startup blew up and he was in sales. So he was on massive commissions and um, then he grew his own business and it was one of the fastest growing companies in Australia. And like some people are just programmed from a young age that lots of money is just a good thing. Yes. Whereas some people are programmed from a young age that lots of money is a bad thing. And I think it oh, depends yeah. on how long you stay in like the education system and how you're brought up and all, there's so many factors. And so for me, the like important part running a business is awareness. It's like being aware of your own limiting beliefs, your own patterns, the things like, what do I have to work through in order to get to this new stage? Whereas like, I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. Definitely not, bro. Definitely not. They 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 just come into it reading expert secrets or traffic secrets and they're like, I need to make content, I need to make offers, I need to do webinars, I need to do like the it's all about like the the um you seen Dan Bolton's pyramid, right? Mm -hmm. The heart. 
head and how hands yeah and like the how is the least important thing at the very top that's what all mm -hmm. the beginners focus on i was lucky enough to have come into this business world only after like two or three, four years of like self-development work, listening to like Bob Proctor and Brian Tracy and Tony Robbins and, you know, Darren Hardy and all these like self-improvement goats. That's all I listened to for years. I didn't know anything about business. All I knew was like how to optimize my state of mind and how to, uh, you know, optimize my, my self-image. But I knew nothing mm -hmm. about business. And so, so when I finally did step into business, shit clicked pretty quickly for me because I'd already done all the work. Yeah. I put that chapter first. And a lot of people, they just, that's not even a chapter in the book. They're not even aware of it. Like you mm -hmm. said, they're just like, and that's why I love that pyramid because you need both, right? You can't, there's a bunch of people who are yeah. basically monks. All, yeah. All hard. And they're like, <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're fully awakened and they're fully aligned, but they're broke as fuck because yeah. they just haven't put any effort into, into the how. Bro, then that was that was me for a while too. It's like because I in self improvement, you don't talk about the how. You just talk about optimizing your state and you know manifest bringing it in. But there was no mention of like I was always looking for like what's the actual strategy though, like what's yeah. this whole like I didn't I wasn't aware of a cold this old flow. I wasn't aware of like add to webinar to book a call or I wasn't aware of like content to freebie to conversation to workshop. You know I was not aware of any mm -hmm. of that stuff. Now that I am, it's fun to geek out over that stuff. And for us, it works when we learn it because we've already done a good amount of the work. I'm sure the work will never end, but we've already done so much work that for you and I, whenever we do come across a new how, we can make it work within a week. Like, most of the time. Yeah, most of the time. In almost any industry, though, it's like we could figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, once you know the principles, um, it's not actually that complicated. Yeah, well, once you've gotten over yourself, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah cool man well uh i think next time we chat uh we'll have to i'll have to rent a podcast studio here in dubai i didn't realize you were here yeah let's do it let's do it i'm actually heading back to the uk and europe for summer and then i'll be back out in dubai in october probably okay uh, probably me too ish i'm heading yeah heading away in the summer nice. summer here is brutal bro yeah i've heard are you so are you out here like full time? So you've got your residency, you've got like a place you live and stuff like you're, you're fully oh, yeah, sort of I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm doing Airbnb at the moment, so it's super pricey, but um, yeah, looking for a place to rent all year, but then only be here part of the year. Mm. That's the that's the have goal. you done the maths on that? Because I was looking at it the other day, and like if you find the right Airbnb and negotiate a little bit, I don't think there's a huge, huge amount of difference if you did like 10 months at Airbnb. But do, do you um you need like a permanent address or you need like a contract or whatever to get your Emirates ID or not? What did I do? No, you don't. I think I just used the address of the company that was helping me get my Emirates ID. I said, that's right. My address, and that worked. Okay. Because then mail got shipped there and then they forwarded it to me. I think you see the place for right. me. Okay. That um, makes sense. You're not, you're not a resident yet? No. Planning no. on it? Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, Just, yeah, I've got someone who lives here who's offered to basically help me set everything up cool. pretty much for free because he wants to look at adding that in as a service in his business. So, cool. But yeah. if you have any recommendations also of like any good companies, because I've had a few people that I know being a bit screwed over by... um various companies well you said you already got a guy right yeah but just in case like he's he's i think he's done it once or twice before but it's not like an official service so just in case he decides that actually it's like too much effort or whatever okay yeah i'll hook you up with the company i'll send you the info of the company that helped me i've already um hooked my friend up with the same company they helped him too so they're... nice what are they called just out of interest uh oh right here look at this commit biz nice i've probably seen them like advertising on uh on instagram transforming your business dreams into reality dude that's what you want what a tagline <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they're cool um where are you based right now like uh, are you in the marina or palm so at the moment i'm in albarari do okay. you know that yeah. 
just like a little bit out of town it's um a little like jungle paradise there's like rivers and lakes and trees and it's a, it's pretty crazy you recommend yeah if you've got a car and a again car. a little a little, little bit pricey no but my friend does and she's been like being my taxi but um but i've been looking at the palm actually so i do need to figure out where i want to where i want to stay so are you i don't have, i don't i don't have a car but i don't need one because mm. i have a gym 30 second walk away. I have a grocery store, 30 second walk away. I have a pool, 30 second walk away. I have an ocean, 30 second walk away. Literally 30 seconds. I hold my breath and go there. Right. I have a mall, two minute walk away. Okay. Can't hold my breath that far, but I'm close enough to throw a rock and hit it pretty much. Uh, and then if I need a taxi, I just walk outside and there's a bunch of taxis ready to go. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the perfect spot right here. It's just very pricey on Airbnb. It's like, um, in the summer, it's a lot cheaper. In the summer, it's half price. So in the summer, it's four grand a month here. And right now, it's like eight grand a month. Fucking hell. But it's fucking nice. But yeah, it's yeah. it's always fucking major money. But um, at least for me, eight grand a month. Yeah. But, and uh, are you... um, is, What's the like office slash co-working setup like there because that's one thing that i love i love getting out i don't like working from the apartment all the time i do not like working from the apartment either unless we're doing this yeah yeah my favorite work to do is i go to the mall and i just go to one of the coffee shops put my headphones in put on some sound blocker and lo-fi music and just get to work okay cool so you're sort of going to like cafes and things yeah but what about me what about like meeting people and stuff do you do you find that that do you know luke belmar no. YouTube search him. He's a big name. Um, you'll meet people here at the Palm. Like I just randomly walked by. I saw Luke yesterday. I said, what's up? Um, people are just here. The Palm attracts uh, serious entrepreneurs, let's say. Okay. So, meet people. Um, eventually, you get their Telegram. You get their WhatsApp. You create a group meet, meet up. Do you know Ed from Film Booth? Nope. Oh. Um, Film Booth is a fucking great channel, bro. Check it out. Like you can binge watch his channels all day and learn a lot. He's like helps creators optimize for YouTube business owners. Okay. Really, really nice. good. Film Booth. Anyways, uh, went for a business hangout with him and a bunch of other business people last week. So it's just you just get invited to hang out with people if you're here long enough. Nice, yeah. Uh, I've been here for a month now, but I've I've been to Dubai like five or six times before. Okay. But this is the first time I'm like looking seriously at, yeah, moving out here basically. Well, I'll get your number next time something's happening. I'll send you a text. Yeah, nice. That'll be cool, man. Um, I've got a friend as well. The guy that's helping me set up, he's actually just launching um, like a Dubai sort of entrepreneurs community because I think there's a few around, but apparently they're not that great. Um, and so yeah, I think this one will be quite cool. I can send it. He's got a score app actually. You can see he set his page up on score app, so you can see um, how he does it. Like when you say join the waitlist or whatever, he'll like ask questions. So cool. Yeah, I'll send you the link. Sounds All right, man. Good. Well, take care and uh, see you in person next time. Yeah, nice one, dude. Thanks for the invite, Ted. Appreciate it, man. Cheers, man. Take care. Bye now. See you soon. Cheers, bye.